I'm Corey Johnson, in for Caroline Hyde, who is in for Emily Chang. I'm still Corey Johnson, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Well, coming up, the resistance continues. 97 tech companies take a stand as San Francisco becomes ground zero in the fight against President Trump's travel ban. And plus, we're going to tap into VR on Wall Street. A new report takes a detailed look on who will be making money off virtual reality. And Uber's actually researching, get this, floating taxis. We're going to talk to the man who literally wrote the book on Uber's flying cars. But first to the lead, the epicenter of the international debate of President Donald Trump's immigration policy is right here in San Francisco today. The ban temporarily restricted citizens from seven Muslim majority countries from entering the U.S. with a permanent ban on refugees from Syria. It remains on hold, however, after a federal judge in Seattle issued a restraining order late last week against the enforcement of the ban. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals here in San Francisco is now deciding whether to restore the ban or side with the earlier ruling in Washington state. That decision is expected any moment. We'll bring in that news as it crosses. But the case took on an increased business importance over the weekend as 97 companies, including some of the biggest names in tech, Apple, Facebook, Google, and many others, filing a legal brief condemning the ban, citing business reasons. For more on how the Trump administration has responded, let's bring in Bloomberg's White House correspondent Shannon Pettypiece in Washington. Shannon, really glad to have you. What's the very latest? I mean, the deadline for a response from the Trump administration was a couple, what, two minutes ago? Uh, yeah, so they get their response in, and now we could either have the appeals court, they could issue a ruling off that, or they could request to hear oral arguments in the case. But either way, everybody thinks now this is just headed to the Supreme Court because whichever side loses this appeals court ruling will then appeal to the Supreme Court, which will have the final say. And the schedule for that, um, you know, it's possible that they could hear it in this session and um, issue a final ruling over, you know, by the end of the summer before the court uh, takes their recess for the year. Yeah, and sorry, I misspoke. Uh, my time zones are all screwed up. Uh, they, they, the Trump administration does have, now have 57 minutes, or 56.30 and counting, to get that response. I don't, even, do we, I don't know what time it is either. <laughs> <laughs> do we expect um, a, a, a vociferous response here uh, in reaction to what not just the, the, the Ninth Circuit said here in San Francisco, but the judge in Washington, who very interestingly cited business reasons, he cited economic impact, not just for the individuals who are being kept out of this country, but, uh, but indeed for the businesses that would be affected within this country. Yeah, which is a bit of a novel argument. I mean, everything about this is kind of novel because there's never been sort of a travel restriction ban like this placed on a group of people before. But yeah, arguing that it was in the best interest of the company to remove this um, restriction because it was harming business. It was harming the economic interests of the country. So yeah, this argument really came down to businesses and to companies like some of the ones that you mentioned, these tech companies uh, really coming out and supporting that argument. Now, given the, the, the nature where most of these bans are, are temporary, a pause, as the phrase has been used, that's not the case with Syria, from what I understand. But uh, it, I wonder if this whole debate, this whole argument, and it really is playing into the hands of the message that Trump wants to give to both of his, both his supporters and that right-wing base, saying, we, we're fighting this. We're going we're gonna to keep those, those people out. We're going to make this country safer. And we're gonna ha we like this argument continuing so we can keep talking about this as opposed to the other things that we're doing. Yeah, this was really a way to deliver on one of his campaign promises. This was something he brought up during the campaign. It was controversial then. They knew it would be controversial now because it was controversial then. Uh, but it's a way to deliver on that promise of saying, hey, we said border security was going to be important to us. We said we were going to do everything we could to make sure that people coming into this country were vetted the way we feel like they should be vetted. Though there haven't been a lot of details on how exactly they want to be vetting these people if they don't like the current system. But yeah, it's delivering on that campaign campaign promise in a very bold, early, um, you know, uh, aggressive way, which is really all he can do right now as an executive order because he doesn't have so much of his cabinet in place. Yeah, there's a, there's a meta way to look at this as well. Shannon Pettypiece, glad to have both from you, our Bloomberg White House reporter. Really appreciate it. Our leaders in the technology sector among the first and the most outspoken critics of President Trump's executive order on immigration on the corporate side. And why? Well, because with many of the companies that define U.S. tech today would not exist had it not been for immigrants. Here's a quick recap.
are here to, with us to discuss and, uh, the tech industry's view on U.S. immigration. Guest host for the hour is Sukinder Singh Kasi. She's the founder of an e-commerce startup called Joyous, as well as Boardless. She worked at Google, an initiative that Boardless uh, promotes a gender diversity in company boards. Former president of Google, Asia Pacific, and Latin American operations, as well as an advisor to Twitter. So uh, I, I don't mean to make you speak for all the world of technology, but if you want to claim to, you may. Uh, but I, I do think it's interesting that we have so many companies across so many different uh, sorts in the world of technology coming together on this issue. Is it about the progeny of these companies that Intel, that Andy Grove was, you know, famously, you know, that, that let Sergey Brin, that, that we know so many companies came from immigrants, or is it about the way businesses are happening today? I think it's about both, quite frankly. I think if you look at the history of some of the most famous tech companies, we just saw it, and of course there is a lot to look to in terms of the data historically. But even today in Silicon Valley, over 58% of the highly skilled workers here, you know, are immigrants. So when you step back and look at our labor pool, right, the source of innovation, it is, it is sort of had been, has been bred by openness and open, an open immigration policy that lets the best and brightest minds in the world flow easily into this country. Um, and and the, the notion of, of non-comprehensive immigration reform, that is, uh, which has been a, a Republican argument, right, which is more H-1B visas will we'll keep the people crossing the Mexican border illegally out. Let's let the people we want in. Let's let the people, Donald Trump has spoken uh, in, in, in Trumpian ways about the people that are going to do good things and make us money, let's let them and let's keep the other ones out. Well, of course, I mean, it's easy to say that in theory, but in practice, these are very broad brush strokes when, in fact, there's very little data to suggest that U.S. terrorism has been founded by the companies and the, by the countries that are, you know, whose people are being kept out. So I think if you were to say innovation comes I mean, you're from... You're taking the argument that the 9-11 the bombers were from other countries, like Saudi Arabia. Right, but if you look others. at more recent terrorist acts, right. you can speak to people who've been actually born in the United States, right? right? And are homegrown terrorists. Right. So if you look at sort of solving terrorism on the one hand and a broad brush swath that says immigration, you know, has to be stopped from these seven countries, and by the way, innovation won't happen from anybody who comes from these seven countries, I mean, it's fairly ludicrous to suggest that keeping these countries out will somehow keep America safe. The converse is not true, which is when you create broad policy policies that keep out innovation, right, and right. us from accepting the smartest and brightest people in the world who are willing to come and build companies here on which the entire U.S. economy will prosper, there's a large argument in favor and very little data to suggest that any of the people here are responsible for uh, the mm -hmm. recent acts of terrorism that we've seen. John Doerr from Kleiner has been saying for at least 15 years we should staple a green card to every single degree coming out of Stanford because we want those people to start companies here, not take them back to China, wherever else they might have come from to get that education. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the ironies in all of this is Donald Trump talks about being pro-business and about making America great again. One of the ways to make the American economy great is to have great companies started here. Not in India, not in China, not in Canada, but if you want to have a great and robust U.S. economy, it starts with fostering innovation here, and that includes having an open immigration policy. So let me ask you finally about H-1B visas. It's an important issue to Silicon Valley. It has been touted as such, but in practice, the H-1B visa program has been a little more um, uh, abuse is too strong, but there have been certain companies that have cobbled together lots of H-1B visa programs. Some people have complained that those people can't actually go around and find other jobs because their, their, their ability to live in this country is basically a staple to their ID card where they can't leave and go somewhere else and, and pursue gainful employment elsewhere. I wonder if you look at that as a program that's necessary or needs reform? Well, I would say to you, the H-1B program is absolutely necessary, and I happen to be one of those immigrants right. who, uh, who started my company based on the fact that I got here through an H-1B and converted through to an EB-1, which is an extraordinary person's visa. And that allowed me to actually leave the company who bought me here and to go start my own company. Um, so, it's, and companies large and small, my company is much, much smaller than Google and benefits from H-1Bs. So I don't think it's a case where H-1Bs go disproportionately only to the large companies. I mean, let's put it this way. It allows allows you to find a way here. Once you're here, you know, your means to be gainfully employed at large or small company is really a function of your resume and your ability to transfer the H-1B. And there are very um, proper and, and well-used procedures for doing that between companies. So I don't think it's the case where the H-1B is a red herring that's gobbled up only by large companies. I think you will find that in every Silicon Valley company, large and small, there is one or two H-1B <laughs> beneficiaries right. to be found. It is, I'll tell you, it's amazing how the conversation has shifted here in the world of technology where we used to argue for H-1Bs and now we're just talking about letting people in the country at all. I know. Great stuff. All right, so Kinder Singh Cassidy is going to stay with us throughout the hour and I'm grateful for that. Appreciate Thank it. You.
Our one soccer watching com score shares falling the most in more than seven months after the company warned it's at risk of being delisted by the NASDAQ. They said it won't make their February 23 deadline to file financial disclosures, which haven't been filed for quite a while now. Comscore tracks online viewership for websites, uh, box office performance, and the like in Hollywood. Our coming up, virtual reality is not new, but it may be at a tipping point for mass adoption. Is VR becoming an investment reality? We're going to break down investment opportunities in VR next. This is Bloomberg. All right, some breaking news here. Two big companies, both of them selling computer hardware, both of them have women executives, both of them saw earnings and revenues shrink, and both of them gave record pay to their CEOs. Meg Whitman and Ginny Romney. Meg Whitman of HPE, of course, uh, Ginny Romney of IBM, both uh, the proxy statements are out here with the news of what they got paid. Romney receiving $5.95 million in a payout for this year, a big uh, improvement in her pay for the year. And over at Hewlett Packard, you think uh, $5.9 million, say $4.9 or let's call it $5 million in a stock bonus is big for uh, Ginny Romney. Meg Whitman, $35.6 million at HPE. So uh, big news there in executive compensation. All right, now on to Disney. Disney is in the hot seat. The company's CFO says profit growth this year could be modest. ESPN was once considered Disney's crown jewel. Uh, that Now the sports network is at an 11-year low in subscribers. Cable billionaire John Malone and others suggesting Disney should consider divesting from its crown jewel ESPN. Bloomberg Scarlet Food dove into Disney earnings today, and the numbers don't lie. The importance of ESPN is apparent in Disney's operating income. In fiscal 2016, the Media Networks Group made up almost half of operating income. ESPN is Disney's highest profit generating network. And that network by far leads its peers in monthly affiliate fees. But ESPN's leading position exposes it to the highest risk as well, especially now that the TV bundle concept is starting to lose favor. ESPN's ratings fell 11% in 2016. Now, its U.S. subscriber base alone has shrunk to 90 million. Disney says it will launch a subscription-based online version of ESPN this year. So while the network is gaining new streaming services, its revenue remains under pressure because of an erosion of its traditional customer base. Outside of the television networks, Disney's movie studio division has been a bright spot, leading the industry in market share and delivering record profit. The division banked almost $3 billion at the box office last year alone. And let's not forget Disney's theme parks. It is, after all, the world's biggest theme park operator. The recent opening of a park in Shanghai, however, weighed on park profits. Yet Disney does expect to break even on the park in fiscal 2017. Meantime, it's also still expanding with Star Wars and Avatar our themed lands. Disney may even make a deal this year, a deal move, one that has nothing to do with those calls to divest ESPN. For months, there's been speculation that Disney could buy Netflix or perhaps even Twitter. We'll get more color from Disney CEO Bob Iger when the company releases earnings after Tuesday's U.S. opening bell. That was Bloomberg's Scarlet Foo with a look at Disney. Let's continue looking at Disney and uh, the impact of cord cutting. Joining us right now from our Princeton studio, Geetha Raghunathan of Bloomberg Intelligence. Geetha, uh, is this an important quarter for Disney? You know, the, I was looking at the 21st Century Fox results we just got, and it was such a powerful quarter for them, but they had the election, they had the World Series. You'd expect it to be so big for them. But then Disney had Star Wars. Yeah, and um, you know, the expectations for the whole of fiscal 2017, I mean, management has telegraphed this really well to investors. It's going to be a little bit of uh, tempered results, uh, especially in, fisc in the fiscal first quarter. Um, we're going to see some tough comparisons um, at the park segment, at the film segment, and consumer products. So it's, I think it's going to be a little bit of a soft quarter, but that, that has been telegraphed pretty decently. Uh, uh, so I, I get the Star Wars dynamic. I, th I think I know the ABC dynamic there. Theme parks, so uh, what's the, what's the uh, curveball in theme parks in Q4 of last year? Yeah, so what happened is uh, because of Hurricane Matthew, uh, they had to close the parks down, and so they're expecting a little bit of uh, headwinds to operating profit, about $40 million. And then, again, there was a shifting of the holiday period from uh, the December quarter to the March quarter, about one week, and that's causing uh, about $20 million of operating profit to kind of shift into the March quarter. So th some, some uh, weakness expected there because of comps. So really, Hurricane, you should expect headwinds? Okay, that's probably good advice across all realms of the universe. Uh, finally, where do you see one's place for our upside? Just about 20 seconds here. 
I mean, movies has been their absolute home run. It, it's, it continues to be firing on all cylinders. Uh, we're going we're to see an absolute blowout. 2017 Beauty and the Beast is above all expectations here. And then fiscal 2018 for movies, again, is going to be an absolute blockbuster. Keith Raghunathan of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you very much. All right, piece of breaking news in the tech revolving door. BuzzFeed reporting that Snap's head of creative strategy is leaving the company right after the IPO is filed, but before the IPO happened. Greg Wax joined the company back in 2014, worked closely with advertising agencies, but the leadership turnover is something Snap has struggled with in the past. At one point in 2015, they lost eight top execs over just 12 months. All right, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tuesday will be live from the Makers Conference in Palos Verdes, California. Susan Lin, the, uh, the BBG Ventures founder, once the CEO of Martha Stewart Living, will be joining us tomorrow. But for now, that's it. This is Bloomberg. Your morning commute's about to get a lot more exciting. Uber has just hired Mark Moore from NASA. They're naming him uh, their director of engineering for aviation with a look at developing flying cars. Bloomberg's Technologies, Brad Stone, joins us right now. Brad, this is something you guys wrote about this last year in Bloomberg yeah. Business Week. This is one of the funnest stories going on right now. It's awesome. Yeah, because. And you know I hate Gee Whiz Nito stories, but yeah. I love this. Well, look, if you're a science fiction fan, the idea of a flying car or a or even a small aircraft that takes off and lands vertically, that runs on electric power, that maybe one day is automated, is just cool. So a little background. Seven years ago, uh, a guy named Mark Moore at NASA wrote a paper, he's from Langley, about the feasibility of this. There's a Stanford professor named Elon Crew. He started talking to Larry Page. They eventually spawned two companies. One is Z Arrow, one is Kitty Hawk. Ashley Vance and I wrote about these companies. They're, they're very secretive. Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk. Which is a noted name in the world of, of aviation. Of course, the Wright brothers. So uh, we, uh, we wrote about these two companies that are working on so-called flying cars. Uber, at the end of last year, wrote a white paper saying that they wanted to play a role in this new ecosystem of flying cars, not necessarily build a flying car themselves, at least not yet, but they think they have a role to play in changing regulations and in negotiating with suppliers and creating new, say, battery technology. My story today is they recently hired that guy from Langley, Mark Moore, who wrote the paper back in 2010. So adding a lot of firepower, this is very real. Silicon Valley is working on it. You will be soaring through the airs to your job one day, maybe not soon, but perhaps one day. Or not. Or not. Good, good, but I, good I, job. I do think it's really interesting that, that Uber is a company that has taken, and you, you write about this, but, but it, it's a company that could have been all cloud. I don't mean cars in the clouds, but I mean a company that really takes the advantages of other people do the hardware, where where the cash is transacted. And instead, they're, they're doing things of, that they very easily could have left to others. And I wonder what it is about the mentality of this company that is, on one hand is all about leverage in the cloud and, and using Amazon Web Services on the back end and using computers, phone, consumers' phones on the front end, and, and, but still sinking a lot of money into development of actual hardware of the cars. Well, I think there are two explanations. One may be positive, one a little more cynical. The cynical explanation is they worry that this will happen without them, that Google would develop a driverless car or Z Aero or uh, Boeing would develop a flying right. car, and they don't need Uber. So one, Uber needs to be involved in some way, or they risk being left behind. Disintermediated. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, you invent the future you want to see. It's the same reason that Amazon, you know, developed the Alexa, developed the Kindle. Um, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to see a future, if you want to solve real problems in cities around transportation, then you have to be involved in advocating for it. And I think Uber has the resources to do that. Well, it's just interesting. They've, they've sucked up all the robot, the AI and robotics engineers out of Carnegie Mellon, right? Then they're sucking up these guys who are developing these. It's interesting, the, the cherry picking of academia. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny because Google, you know, got a lot of criticism for the big bets, right? Doing right. these things in house, and one by one, they've been spinning them out. You know, driverless cars, actually, now the Waymo division is. Uh, is obviously very central to Google's plans and transportation, but this, these flying car projects they decided to do out of, out of right. outside the company. And now here Uber is developing at least some capability in-house. Well, um, as I mentioned, you've written about it. It's in this great book. Oh, Corey. This Thank book, you. it's on. It's time to start shopping for this book now. Someone you love should get at least a few copies. 
Would you, would you, what's this book called? The Upstarts yes. by Brad Silver. Have you finished it? Because there's would a quiz you sign when it you're done. Me? Yeah, it'd be ab absolutely. If you sign it for me, you'll keep I... trying to stop trying to take it back. So <laughs> this is a big moment. But it, it really is terrific, and, and I've yet to finish it, but I will. Okay, well, when, when you're done, we'll do an on air quiz. That's fabulous. Okay. Great stuff. Brad Stone, author of The Upstarts, and our technology editor here at Bloomberg News. We appreciate you coming on. All right, next, we're going to greet the, the week and dive into the tech stories that are front and center in the days ahead. Looking forward to the latest with tech giants up in arms over Trump's travel ban. We'll have that breaking news as it crosses. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. UK House of Commons Speaker John Burkow is adamant about his intention to block President Trump from addressing Parliament. Trump visits Britain later this year. It is customary for visiting presidents to speak in London's Westminster during state visits. But as Speaker, Burkow has the authority to block visiting figures. German Chancellor Angela Merkel says she will seek common ground wherever possible with the Trump administration. Merkel told reporters in Munich that despite their differences over Mr. Trump's travel ban, she will look at each issue separately to see if there are places where the two countries can cooperate. French presidential candidate Francois Fillon says he has nothing to hide and that his wife's salary was perfectly justified. At a news conference in Paris, the former PM acknowledged his wife worked as his parliamentary assistant for 15 years. The practice is legal but frowned on in France. Penelope Fillon was reportedly paid $900,000 over 15 years. French far-right candidate Marine Le Pen will take back control of the central bank and lead the country out of the euro if she is elected president. That is according to her chief economic advisor. Le Pen has declared that the same nationalist forces that led Donald Trump to victory will do the same for her. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Monday here in New York, already 6.30 Tuesday morning in Hong Kong. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Rosalind Chin with a look at the markets. Rosalind, good morning to you. Thanks, Elisa. Well, New Zealand markets reopened after a long weekend break, and they're trading lower, taking their cue from Wall Street. And taking a look at the futures in Australia and Japan, it looks like those markets will also be following a similar pattern. Now, speaking of Australia, we're expecting a central bank decision later. The, Royal, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia is expected to keep rates at 1.5%, a record low. Now, we're also expecting to see uh, the latest uh, reserves, uh, China Forex Reserves figures coming out uh, later today as well. Now, the key question there is, will they fall below the psychologically important $3 trillion mark? We saw them already pretty close in December at $3.01 trillion. So the key question this month is, will they drop below that or will they fall to actually $3 trillion? And finally, a quick look at Toyota. Those results came out after the bell on Monday, and they raised their sales and operating uh, profit forecast for the year, but missing analysts' uh, estimates. And uh, they're saying that one of the key challenges going forward is uh, the possible trade tensions with the U.S. I'm Rosalind Chin here in Hong Kong. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology, and I'm Corey Johnson. Let's get back to our top story of the day, and that's the battle over Donald Trump's immigration order. The president uh, had his order, and 97 tech companies had their word from Airbnb to Zynga. They filed a legal brief Sunday night condemning the travel ban. Uh, the brief emphasizes the importance of immigrants to the economy as well as society, sure to set off uh, the agenda for the week. Joining us right now to discuss this and other big stories on the docket, uh, Bloomberg Technology Sarah Fryer is still with us. Joyous founder Sukinder Singh Cassidy, former president of Google's Asia Pacific and Latin America operations and advisor to Twitter once upon a time. We'll get to Twitter. I want to start with Trump. You wrote a great story about this thing. Uh, um, all these tech companies coming together, but framing their argument around the economy and technology. Absolutely. They're saying that immigrants have long fueled our economy. The tech industry is is you know special in that many of the companies have been started by immigrants or built up by immigrants. And so I think they feel a duty to make this statement that said, you know, as we discussed earlier on Bloomberg Radio, 
this could get worse for these companies if, if Donald Trump does something about H-1B visas. If, they, if he goes any further in this direction, this could certainly harm their businesses beyond what it has already. And I think, uh, so Kinder, it's interesting to me too that companies you know, have historically just don't want to get involved in politics in a public way, even though they may be very active in lobbying and pushing for certain kinds of legislation. You certainly say that during an election, maybe a little bit less than during this election. But 97 companies at a very early stage of this from a sort of uh, legislative uh, lawmaking way uh, getting involved here in a very loud way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, look, I think a couple things that you've pointed out too. Historically, companies have tried to be apolitical. I would say over the course of the last five, six, seven years, you've seen many, many tech companies from net neutrality on to immigration yeah. have really felt the need to staff up their lobbying efforts. But I think what we're seeing here with immigration is pretty unprecedented. I mean, if you look at organizations like Forward.us, you know, they thought they were dealing with things like how to up the number of H-1B visas. I feel like things have sort of gone from this level to this level for tech companies and their desire uh, to make their voices heard on immigration. Well, maybe his policy is moving in the exact opposite direction, moving backwards <laughs> towards restricting Absolutely. immigration. Although in the history of this country, we've seen it uh, come and go flow. in waves, and it has gone in very dramatic fashion. Uh, and then we expect this decision to go maybe Supreme Court, and even in the next hour, uh, depending on what appeals are filed here. The other thing I'd note is that, is that employees are hearing, uh, the companies, I'm sorry, are hearing from their customers very directly. You know, when it seems like Uber was behind the Trump administration, delete Uber, trended I, on Twitter. Hashtag delete hashtag Uber. Hashtag delete Uber. Uh, we've seen other, other pressures against Elon Musk, for example, for being on Trump's business council. So there's a lot of, of bubbling up. Employees of tech companies have protested at SFO. We even saw Sergey Brin there yes. protesting the immigration order. So this is really something that is bubbling up, not just from the the um, legal side of things. I didn't know he was there. I was, uh, yeah. I was uh, overseas last week and missed that news. Yes, yes. Uh, literally overseas last week, so I missed <laughs> that. That's uh, fantastic. Because you, know, you, you had Jack Dorsey uh, protesting in, uh, in, in St. Louis last year. Right. It's Black very interesting. Matter. Matter. Last. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Right, I want to turn to Twitter. Uh, Twitter. Speaking hashtag, of Jack. Speaking of hashtag. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Jack Dorsey. You were once an advisor to Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, the, the numbers out of Twitter since you stopped advising mm -hmm. a couple of years ago have gotten pretty bad. I mean, in mm -hmm. terms of user growth, in terms of even growing revenue per user, that's still getting a little bit better. But what do you think is the most important thing uh, business analysts, those of us who are trying to understand that business, should be focused on? I think, it's, I think it's exactly what you said. I mean, unfortunately, the story on Twitter remains the same story, which is user growth has stalled, right, among a uh, 300 million odd users globally who see value in sort of being on the platform. And by the way, there's obviously a lot of secondary impressions that Dick Costolos and other, others pointed to in terms of Uber's, uh, right. in terms of Twitter's overall effect on, the, on a wider user base. But honestly, the story is user growth, user growth, user growth. And I think while they've done a really good job on monetization, number one issue is expanding their user base, particularly when you look at everyone from Facebook to Snap, right, becoming the new forms of sort of dis, uh, distribution of premium content. Snap. I missed that too last week, uh, uh, the, the filing <laughs> of the Snap IPO. That's another one. User growth is already slowing dramatically. Well, uh, yes. I mean, Snap is... Uh, this is the last quarter. I should say over the last year, of course, looks yeah, great. Yeah, of course. But. Snap over the last year looks great. Over the last quarter, a little more challenged. Having said that, Snap is um, Snap has one key benefit that Twitter doesn't, which is if you look at the demographics of its user base, it is a, a good Very generation young. to two generations younger. Um, and so um, I think the other one to watch here, which you probably know is private company Musical.ly, looks like the next generation of Snap. Um, so Musical.ly is really big in my house. Absolutely, it is in mine as well. So my point is Twitter has a demo pro my, my children are 7 and 11. Yes, my 11-year-old exactly right can't age. get her yeah. off at Musical.ly. And my, and my stepson is 17. And of course, so you, I see the distinction between Musical.ly and Snap in my very own household. So Twitter is both an overall growth problem, and then its demo is another challenge. Obviously. But then with something like Musical.ly, you wonder how long it's really going to last in, in the hearts of these young people. Uh, and Snap, same thing. I mean, they have, they have this, this user growth to a, a healthy level. Is it going to sustain itself? Are we going to, to see them be able to build the advertising business very, very vastly far beyond what it is right now, given that their user growth may stagnate like Twitter's. But the benefit that Snap has, I think, is what Facebook had in the early years, which is once you have a sticky app and a demo, right, you can bring more forms of content to that platform. And, of and course, Snap, Snap has shown that they right. are, are very able to good. innovate in product Absolutely. in a way that we haven't seen from Twitter as dramatically. And that is one of the things that we keep coming back to with this company, is that without a lot of product innovation, how can you right. really grow the user base or change, change what you are? Well, you know who watches this show every day without fail? 
Elon Musk. Because the news just crossed from Reuters, it says that Tesla and SpaceX are going to join uh, the legal brief against the immigration order. So he clearly was listening to you, Sarah. <laughs> he clearly doesn't well, listen to me. Well, fabulous to hear. I mean, well. I, think, I think Elon's probably trying to make a point that you can both be engaged with Mr. Trump or President Trump and disagree with his policies actively at the same time. Uh, Sukhinder and Cassidy, thank you very much. We appreciate you going to stay with us here. Sarah Fryer, I want to thank you as well. Uh, and Sukhinder, I want to talk about uh, uh, what you guys are doing. Uh, with your company, uh, 2016, there's a McKinsey report that we looked at, uh, and it points out sort of the role of women in technology. 37% of them stuck in entry-level jobs. Mm -hmm. So there may be a lot of women in technology, maybe not a lot of women in technology, but most of them stuck in those jobs. Um, you guys are focused on this uh, at, at uh, uh, your company, and I wonder sort of what's, what's your sort of end goal and how do you expect to get there? Right. So I think uh, what you're referencing is obviously our work at the board list, which is focused right. on getting board list, I'm sorry. board list. Yes, which is focused on getting more women on boards overall, starting with tech company boards. And so, look, our end game is, uh, as you described, which is women's participation in the talent economy is lagging at many different levels. Entry talent level. Talent economy. The talent economy. Okay. I mean, if you think and come back to your point on immigration, right? This is not just an innovation economy; it's a talent economy. I mean, one is directly related to the other. And so, when you think about the access to talent, we know that women are lagging at all levels. The board list specifically is focused on women in the boardroom and because the stats there are as bad as they are in other every other level that, in which the tech industry is tracking. Our end goal to see women at equal representation gender wise um, and industry wise in every tech boardroom and non-tech boardroom globally. Oh, well, uh, great stuff and certainly something that's desperately needed so I appreciate that too. Thank you. Uh, from Boardlist and from Joyous, uh, Sukinder, Sukinder uh, Singh Cassidy, thank you very much, as well as Sarah Fryer, thank you. All right, yet another revolving door in technology. Zenefits has a new CEO, Jay Fulker. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. He's going to be the third executive to leave the embattled HR startup since 2016. David Sachs announced in December that he'd be stepping down from his role as CEO of that company. His tenure less than a year after taking the reins from its co-founder, Parker Conrad. Coming up, the neighborhood-focused startup next door announcing it's acquiring UK competitor. We're going to sit down with CEO Narav Toila next. This is Bloomberg. The neighborhood-focused social network Next Door has acquired the assets of its British counterpart, Street Life. One and a half million users can now sign up for Next Door before Street Life shuts itself down. Specific terms of the deal have not been released as part of Next Door's international expansion. Obviously, having entered the UK four months ago, right now the CEO joins us, also co-founder uh, Nira Toila. Totally up. Excuse me, I can't even speak today. Just got back from vacation. What no do you want? Rob, good to be um, here. Hey. Uh, this is a huge deal, I would think, for you, because when you look at the easiest markets to move into, I would imagine when you look internationally, UK has got to be kind of top of your list. Well, it's one of the easier ones because of language, but it's also one of the most strategic. Both the size of its user base as well as the ability to monetize in that market makes the UK extremely strategic for us. I should back up and ask what Nextdoor is, if I can try to get you to tell me. In Private social network for neighborhoods. We all use social networks today, Facebook for friends, right. LinkedIn for colleagues. But there hasn't been a social network until Nextdoor that helps us communicate with what we believe is one of the most important communities of them all, and that's the community right outside your front door. I think this is so cool because I think that this is a, it's a company that, that I mean, to be so kind, you know that I'm not usually like that, but I really think that it's important for people to connect with people and for people to connect with their neighbors and to know who their neighbors are and to know what's happening in the community and it changes the asset, the nature of the community, it makes it better. And you guys are doing that with technology. Well, we live in an increasingly divided world, that's the truth. And most social networks, because we handpick our friends or our follower list, they're just echo chambers for us to hear more of the same. As witnessed by the legal the election. Next door is different though. Next door is not about who you know, it's about where you live. It's about coming together with your neighbors to make the neighborhood better for everyone. We've been around for almost five years and now 75% of American neighbor, neighborhoods use the service. So talk to me about revenues and what you might expect. I, I don't expect you to actually tell me your revenues even if I begged. But give me a sense of what this UK opportunity might be if we were to look at it three years from now. Well, last year we had two big priorities. One was to begin international expansion. So we launched in the Netherlands about nine months ago and then the UK four months ago and to start to sow the seeds for monetization. And so we've started, we're testing some things in various markets. We had a very good response from both national businesses and local businesses. And you're gonna see more in 2017 of both international expansion, particularly in Western Europe. And you'll start to see some revenue products that we're pretty excited about. Um, revenue and local advertising has been, a, has been you know, one of the holy grails of, of the internet. And it's been a very difficult thing going 
Now going back 10 or 15 years even, and you've seen different companies come with different approaches. Google, one might argue, is very good at local. Um, Groupon, maybe, maybe not. It's unclear. I wonder, what, when you look at that, you've looked at it more than most people, what do you see as the biggest fallacies about getting local advertising online? Well, the fallacy is that the demand isn't there. The demand is certainly there. The difficulty, and one of the true criticisms is, it's hard to scale. Most of the time when people have successful local monetization, it's because they hire a lot of salespeople. Right. And so one of the big challenges, and we believe Yellow opportunities. Yellow pages style, right? Yellow pages style, thousands of salespeople calling on businesses over and over again. We believe one of the biggest opportunities for Nextdoor is because we're so well adopted, many of our members are the owners of those local businesses. And so they will call on us because they're familiar with the platform and they want to be part of it. Can you make the advertising easy to buy? I mean, Twitter has certainly struggled with that. Although, I, I, let me give Twitter some credit. Twitter's made it a lot easier to buy ads. It's made it a lot easier to buy promoted tweets just by tweaking things, adding buttons, putting things in more logically oriented places. Um, do you look at that as a, as a, as a model at all? or is that Well, the reality is building robust ad systems is actually quite challenging. If you look at the number of engineers that Google employs that are working on ad systems, the number of engineers that Facebook employs, and then Twitter as well. So certainly we would like our systems to be as robust and easy to use as theirs, but we got to get started, and that's where we are now. Um, do you see other models or other formats that might be important here in terms of ads? Or is there, there one kind of format you think is going to work the best? Because, again, you're talking about a very different kind of advertiser. Well, advertising has to be performant, obviously, and it has to be something that local businesses understand. They're not buying AdWords. They don't have an analyst at their shop that's looking at yield and really understanding CPA and CPC. They just want to know that they are a part of the conversation. They want to know that whatever they do, whether it's a Yellow Pages ad, wait, wait, real I, world, I want to push back on that. It seems to me if, if you're Fenton ice cream on Piedmont Avenue in Oakland, you know that if you say you want to buy the AdWords for Oakland ice cream or Piedmont ice cream, which refers to your street or your city, and you know what we want ice cream, right? That's not, they probably know those well, words better. Well, you can better. buy that AdWord, but you don't have a website. So where is that AdWord going to go? I think the fundamental difference between, say, Facebook and Google, who are sending traffic to websites where you can fulfill whatever you're looking for, and next door is that many of our potential advertisers, they fulfill in the real world, not on a website. So let's take the ice cream example. You can buy an ad word for ice cream, but how are you going to actually sell the ice cream? You're going to do that in person. So we're looking at models that introduce these businesses to consumers in an easy to understand way, but then the consumers have to go out and patronize the actual stores. Yeah, mail order ice cream. <laughs> it's going to melt before it gets to you. Another reason I didn't go to business school. Uh, great stuff. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the deal. Uh, Nira Tolia, the CEO of Nextdoor. All right, Tuesday, Bloomberg Technology will be live at the Makers Conference in Palos Verdes, California. Caroline Hyde will be there, bringing you several interviews, including Tim Armstrong, CEO of AOL. Coming up, Disney is getting set to uh, report earnings after the bell tomorrow. How much will cord cutters impact their bottom line? We're going to discuss that. This is Bloomberg. All right, some breaking news here. Two big companies, both of them selling computer hardware, both of them have women executives, both of them saw earnings and revenues shrink, and both of them gave record pay to their CEOs. Meg Whitman and Ginny Romney, Meg Whitman of HPE, of course, uh, Ginny Romney of IBM, both uh, the proxy statements are out here with the news of what they got paid. Romney receiving $5.95 million in a payout for this year, a big uh, improvement in her pay for the year. And it, over at Teal Pack, you think uh, 5.9 million, I say 4.9 or what's called $5 million in a stock bonus is big for uh, Ginny Romney. Meg Whitman, $35.6 million at HPE. So uh, big news there in executive compensation. All right, now on to Disney. Disney is in the hot seat. The company's CFO says profit growth this year could be modest. ESPN was once considered Disney's crown jewel. Uh, that Now the sports network is at an 11-year low in subscribers. Cable billionaire John Malone and others suggesting Disney should consider divesting from its crown jewel ESPN. Bloomberg Scarlet Food dove into Disney earnings today, and the numbers don't lie. The importance of ESPN is apparent in Disney's operating income. In fiscal 2016, the Media Networks Group made up almost half of operating income. ESPN is Disney's highest profit generating network. And that network by far leads its peers in monthly affiliate fees. But ESPN's leading position exposes it to the highest risk as well, especially now that the TV bundle concept is starting to lose favor. ESPN's ratings fell 11% in 2016. Now, its U.S. subscriber base alone has shrunk to 9 
90 million. Disney says it'll launch a subscription based online version of ESPN this year. So while the network is gaining new streaming services, its revenue remains under pressure because of an erosion of its traditional customer base. Outside of the television networks, Disney's movie studio division has been a bright spot, leading the industry in market share and delivering record profit. The division banked almost $3 billion at the box office last year alone. And let's not forget Disney's theme parks. It is, after all, the world's biggest theme park operator. The recent opening of a park in Shanghai, however, weighed on park profits. Yet Disney does expect to break even on the park in fiscal 2017. Meantime, it's also still expanding with Star Wars and Avatar are themed lands. Disney may even make a deal this year, a deal move, one that has nothing to do with those calls to devise ESPN. For months, there's been speculation that Disney could buy Netflix or perhaps even Twitter. We'll get more color from Disney CEO Bob Iger when the company releases earnings after Tuesday's U.S. opening bell. That was Bloomberg's Scarlett Foo with a look at Disney. Let's continue looking at Disney and uh, the impact of cord cutting. Joining us right now from our Princeton studio, Geetha Raghunathan of Bloomberg Intelligence. Geetha, uh, is this an important quarter for Disney? You know, the, I was looking at the 21st Century Fox results we just got, and it was such a powerful quarter for them, but they had the election, they had the World Series. You'd expect it to be so big for them. But then Disney had Star Wars. Yeah, and um, you know, the expectations for the whole of fiscal 2017, I mean, management has telegraphed this really well to investors. It's going to be a little bit of uh, tempered results, uh, especially in, fisc in the fiscal first quarter. Um, we're going to see some tough comparisons uh, at the park segment, at the film segment, and consumer products. So it's, I think it's going to be a little bit of a soft quarter, but that, that has been telegraphed pretty decently. Uh, uh, so I, I get the Star Wars dynamic. I, th I think I know the ABC dynamic there. Theme parks, though. So, uh, what's the, what's the uh, curveball in theme parks in Q4 of last year? Yeah, so what happened is uh, because of Hurricane Matthew, uh, they had to close the parks down. And so they're expecting a little bit of uh, headwinds to operating profit, about $40 million. And then again, there was a shifting of the holiday period from uh, the December quarter to the March quarter, about one week. And that's causing uh, about $20 million of operating profit to kind of shift into the March quarter. So th some, some uh, weakness expected there because of comps. So really, Hurricane, you should expect headwinds? OK, that's probably good advice across all realms of the universe. Uh, finally, where do you see one's place for our upside? Just about 20 seconds here. I mean, movies has been their absolute home run. It, it's, it continues to be firing on all cylinders. Uh, we're going we're to see an absolute blowout. 2017, Beauty and the Beast is above all expectations here. And then fiscal 2018 for movies, again, is going to be an absolute blockbuster. Keith Raghunathan of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you very much. All right, piece of breaking news in the tech revolving door. BuzzFeed reporting that Snap's head of creative strategy is leaving the company right after the IPO is filed, but before the IPO happened. Greg Wax joined the company back in 2014, worked closely with advertising agencies, but the leadership turnover is something Snap has struggled with in the past. At one point in 2015, they lost eight top execs over just 12 months. All right, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tuesday will be live from the Makers Conference in Palos Verdes, California. Susan Lin, the, uh, the BBG Ventures founder, once the CEO of Martha Stewart Living, will be joining us tomorrow. But for now, that's it. This is Bloomberg.